You are listening to the Amodamar podcast. In this series, Amoda explores her essential teaching through conversation and excerpts from interviews and events. To find out more about events and to sign up for her newsletter, go to www.amodamar.com. Please subscribe, comment and share if this podcast moves you. And if you feel called to donate, please go to the website. Thanks for listening and we hope you enjoy. Greetings, everyone, and welcome back to another podcast with Amodamar. My name, as you know, is Kavi, and I'm delighted to once again be sitting um, on Zoom with Amoda for another conversation. Hello, Amoda. Hello, Kavi. Okay, let's not beat around the bush, as they say. Um, today, we're going to be talking about identity and non duality, a juicy subject. Normally, we identify with being somebody as defined by our emotions, our thoughts, our likes and dislikes, our roles, what we do and what we have, et cetera, et cetera. I think everybody understands that. But the goal of the non-dual approach to liberation from suffering is to realize that identity is illusory. So. What we're going to do somehow, we haven't got this pre-planned particularly, but we're going to use Amoda's own experience. Um, In the past, many, many years ago, um, of this identified person and to kind of take it from there into the exploration of, of what identity is, what it means to kind of give up the sense of identity, what the what is illusory when it comes to identity? Is it possible to give it up or lose it? You know, radical non-dualism has it that there's no one here. And yes, and yet here we sit. Um, what you know, let, we'll try and get into that a little bit from a, from a perspective of of Amoda. So, I mean, having meandered through that. Let's. I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, see where you want to go with this. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, let's let, let, let's um, begin with the default position, which is. Uh, most people, most of the time, unless they're non-dual, <laughs> identi- born, kind of born <laughs> non-dual, which actually we all are. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. We are born without identity, um, mm. uh, and yet we accumulate identity. Um, and so most people identify with being somebody, yeah, some body, literally a, a body, um uh and with that comes uh, a mind because body and mind are ultimately one <laughs> yeah they're both reflections of each other um so in other words uh identification with thought uh and thought is derived from uh what we do what we have in other words, who we th- we who we think we are, our experiences. So, so our identity, the many layers of identity, which end up becoming who we think we are, or who we think of ourselves as, um, are derived from all our experiences in life, of life, of what we have, what we do, what we gain, what we lose what we like, what we don't like, um, what we believe in, what we don't believe in, uh, what we've been taught or trained or conditioned to uh, hold on to or reject. 
And so all of that becomes our identity. <laughs> and, and, and mostly that's not examined, that remains unexamined identity. It's just, like I say, the default position. Um, now, I could say that, of course, I too uh, had that default position and it was expressed most strongly in the days when I was uh, studying and researching in academia, um, having been trained by my father to be a good girl and <laughs> pass my exams and get good marks, I set on the road of academic achievement and believing that I could be somebody, that I would become somebody, let's put it that way, um, and that somebody would be somebody uh, successful at their academic work. Um, perhaps even pioneering with their research. Um, somebody who had a voice and some authority that came from a qualification. In other words, a, 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 a doctorate, um, in my case, in, in psychology. And so my whole life was motivated by that, to achieve that, to be that, to have proof of that, to receive recognition for that, to receive approval for that. And one fine day, that all came to a grinding crash. Um, Let's talk about that then. <laughs> what the crash? Well, the the the, the I mean, there's so much to talk about in what you say. Um, the whole building of the construct, the motivation behind the building of the construct, the tenuousness of the construct, and then you know the the collapse of the of the construct. construct and by construct, yes. I mean you know the the self that was a motor which is yeah. the same as the self that was Cavi in my own way. And everybody who's listening has suffered from the same construction. Yeah. So, so, yeah, let's just talk a little bit about that. The construct came undone. Yeah. And with that, all the, all the scaffolding that upheld a sense of me as somebody or me as striving to be somebody. So there was a kind of image of myself that I was trying to become, yeah, the successful, the achiever, the, yeah, all the things that I've just touched on. Um, so I was striving to become that. And so that image is what of self of me was what motivated my actions, my behavior, my, where I put my energy, where I put my thoughts, where I put my feelings, my emotions, um, and so on and so on. And that essentially built up to such a degree that it came undone. But it came undone very suddenly and it came undone very dramatically. Now, yeah, you mentioned non-duality, yeah, identity and non-duality at the beginning of this conversation. So the goal, not or one of the goals or one of the yeah possibilities or um uh, of of non-dual realization or the liberation that comes from non-dual liberation a uh, realization rather is the undoing of the construct of me yeah and in that there's a great liberation and essentially that's the question of uh, a true inquiry who am i which mm -hmm. is yeah at the core of all uh 
the, at the core of the path of enlightenment or the path mm-hmm. of liberation. For me, that took place without any self inquiry. Without, without any, w- yeah, without any context then of yes. Okay. There was no context whatsoever. Well, so I wasn't we, we, on a spiritual we were sp- path. No, oh, you weren't. No, no, nothing. no. Nothing. 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 Absolutely nothing. So this was like, uh, it was also in the 80s, I think. Yeah, so. It was in the early, uh, yeah, uh, right through to the late 80s. Uh, okay. um, there, there, there wasn't the, you know, the milieu of spiritual <laughs> teachings that there is now. Uh, non-duality wasn't... Uh, uh, something that was in the in the spiritual culture, unless it was uh, more along the lines of traditional Advaita. Um, and so, I wasn't on a spiritual path. I wasn't on a even a self development path. You know, I wasn't. I wasn't doing any self help methods or anything like that. I was strictly on my academic path. Um, I had explored uh, Jungian. Uh, work uh, and symbology and so on. I had explored some of the uh, some of the transpersonal realms, but more from the point of view of an academic interest. Of course, there was a personal interest, but I hadn't really looked at myself um, in any way. There was no self examination, so there was no context for it, um, and there was no inquiry, and there was no yeah. So it, it, it came as a as a great cataclysm, um, <laughs> and uh, that cataclysm resulted in the not just the crashing down of the construct. Well, not just. I mean, that's the main part. Was the crashing down of the construct of of me. Uh, as somebody or t- striving to become somebody, but it had an impact on on all the structures of my life. So the two kind of imploded mm. together. Yeah. Um, so the academic path or career came to an end and everything that went along with that. And so I was left as a nobody. <laughs> um I, I was left in no man's land and stripped of all concepts and constructs of who I am or who I am trying to become, <laughs> who I am trying to be. It, it all fell away. Um, it was both a a curse and a blessing, or rather it was a cataclysm, it seemed at the time, uh, but also a great be- blessing seen uh, in, in retrospect. retrospect. <laughs> yeah. Um, but because so, it gave me the opportunity yeah. to mm-hmm. explore or to live, if you like, to, to explore. What I mean by that is to feel the energetic impact of being nothing and nobody. You know, I literally lost everything that I owned. I literally, you know, on a material level, I lost my home. I lost my relationship. I lost uh, the, 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 the few possessions that I had, books and clothes and so on and so on. Um, I lost my academic path and my whole raison d'etre. So the motivation was taken away. There was nothing to, to, to strive for. And so, and where I ended up very quickly, which was in a very different, uh, uh, part of society, let's say, from the academic world and from what I had been familiar with, in that world, nobody knew anything about me. (laughs) Nobody knew about my background. Nobody knew about my academia. Nobody knew about where I'd come from. Nobody knew about anything about me. So I kind of literally became nobody. (laughs) 
<laughs> and there was a certain freedom, I think, that you probably experienced in that. So not only was it the trauma or the crushingness of losing the identity, the construct that failed, but actually the liberation. There was a certain, <clears throat> excuse me, and definite liberation from the pressure and the prison of trying to be somebody, of upholding this sense of self, the sense of me as anything. Um, and so certainly there was a great release and relief in that. Do you think that was the one of the seeds of... Uh... Of a, of a subsequent endless, you know, long journey that's kind of brought you to even to this place, the seed of, 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 of non, non dual realization. We never really talked about that, but I, that's now you describe it. That's what it sounds like. Absolutely. Yes. I, I, again, it wasn't conscious. I didn't, yeah, well, yeah. I did, I didn't know that's what it was happening, mm. but it definitely was the seed of going within to, explore who am I? Mm. Who am I without these layers of identity? And that happened for me not through um, uh, following any path of non-dual understanding, but by just looking within. And the first layer was looking at the need for approval that had driven my academic path. Um, and so that was seen, yeah, that was seen, and that was a great uh it was it felt like an ego death or, or certainly one aspect of ego, not the core sense of ego, but uh and it you know a, a a persona, a layer of persona, and so the need for approval came undone um approval from my father um who actually wasn't alive then, <laughs> but still the the, need, the approval was alive. The need yes, for yes, approval yes, was course. alive. Internalized. Um, and then uh, the need for approval uh, from some vague uh, thing, uh, entity that I might call God, the need for approval from life, you know, by life itself, yes, yes. what life yes. brings. So that was a great exploration. So I guess that's the beginning of examining who it am I? Yeah. It also released a certain, uh, I mean, there's so much to say about what you were talking about, but it certainly released a, a kind of wildness in you that, that had not been, uh, existent probably up until that point, because, you know, and, and, and just moving on from that, when you've talked about your past before and you just, you, you, you just said the, 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 the construct um, that, that was demolished, but actually I, 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 I see that the past that's actually happened quite a few times in your past. You were involved in a bombing campaign, you know, when the Turkish, invaded Cyprus, you had to leave who you were. And also, right from the get-go, you were ill-defined, yeah, because, the you, you know, your, your, your original father, the natural birth father, vamoosed within <laughs> a, a very short time. So actually there's been an identity issue all, your, all through your life. Yes, yes, yes. So, and and so, again, so, in yeah. in re in retrospect, I can see um, how the early experiences of having vagueness or confusion or uncertainty <laughs> around identity, <clears throat> identity that's drawn from who our parents are, what our ancestry is, are uh culture yeah, br brilliant. Yeah. uh yeah uh you know our, our sort of dna line or genetic line whatever we want to call it um our environment uh our language even yes uh, exactly all of these things were completely <laughs> uh um i could say fluid uh fragmented uh 
uncertain. It's like there was no real ground of identity to stand on. Wow, you know, even, yeah. even being a girl, uh, which obviously I am uh, or I have <laughs> experience of female body, that's very obvious. But even that wasn't so certain in the sense that my father, uh, not my biological father, but my adopted father, uh, treated me like a boy. Yeah. My hair was cut very short. I used to go to the barbers. Um, He wanted me to achieve like a a boy. Mm. Um, And I wasn't allowed to play with dolls Mm. at all or even, Mm. you know, fluffy stuffed toys, none of the girly things, Um, uh, you know, and so on and so on. And so I, I, I sort of developed, even though I wasn't a tomboy at all, I was actually very girly, <laughs> um, but I developed a kind of boy's mind in terms of be, be, you know, what I wanted to be um, and denied all the, all the feminine things. Um, so it was all very, f- yeah. Fragmented, so, so no ground I, to stand on. So no, that's right. That's why the false. That's why you're such a great teacher, in a sense, because two things. One is that who am I? <clears throat> who am I? The question, the fundamental question of non-duality, has been prevalent actually in your life, as it has for a lot of people, but yours more so than many. Yeah, you know, mine. Mine was a stable, you know, dysfunctional but stable English. 2.1 kids and you know yada yada nuclear family but yours was all over the place you were you were wondering who you were from the very get-go That's and so right. then you created this false construct or the achiever yeah you try to become we all try to become something maybe or yeah and uh so you you, you there, there was the investment yeah <laughs> of right. a mode of the the thing but it was it was inherently flawed from the first place it was and and uh, actually all all those experiences um or conditions if you like of of this life uh and maybe other other sort of karmic uh uh causes if you like or or factors uh, i i actually had a very weak ego self i had a weak sense of myself um even though i was striving to become somebody that was to compensate for that but as a child and growing up uh, i actually had a very weak sense of self mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and so all of that there was no brothers and sisters for any context no brothers either. and sisters no friends no context um, no. no context um and so actually all of that served for uh when the construct did fall apart because it couldn't sustain itself anymore um it happened very quickly and very suddenly but didn't, that didn't lead to for many people caught in the same way in the same trap as most people are that would lead to an irrevocable potential for breakdown which is catastrophic breakdown which could lead to suicide which could lead to addiction which could lead to any sort of uh, violence against oneself or against the other you know to the point that, that it's actually very difficult to recover in many ways, it may take years or years and years, or you may never do it because the investment is so great. And yet here we are with a person such as you, where that that very breakdown did lead either quickly or slowly or whatever to a breakthrough of some kind of uh, form. Now, I'm, I mean, to me, that's a grace, as we've talked about, I know, between us. But wow. Yes, I mean, yeah, you're right. It could lead to all sorts of problems. Um, Because you'd had psychological problems before that. Sorry to interrupt, but you'd had mute problems. You'd had some psychological issues in that sense, not, not, yeah, hadn't you? So, but something happened. Yes, again, you know, that was, that was just the way it was. It was the right time, uh, uh, for something to break through, for a breakthrough. Um, at that point, I was able to, you know, I don't know how it happened, but very quickly, uh, a whole 
different dimension of exploration opened up to me. I was immersed in exploring all the modalities of different types of meditations, of um, different philosophical and esoteric teachings, metaphysical teachings, transpersonal teachings, both on a uh, in terms of the teachings themselves and also the practices, I um, was able to explore my own personal history and uh, a, a, a whole plethora or Pandora's box of of <clears throat> previously suppressed emotions that came up from from my personal history. Um, so I had a rich. Pandora's box to play with. Um, so and and uh, I'm sorry, but and some MDMA as well. <laughs> that was part of the Pandora's box. Yes, a great yeah. a great uh, 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 gift, unbeknownst to me, um, mm. uh, was MDMA, um, which allowed me to. Uh, well, it opened my heart in yeah, a way that hadn't exactly. been opened before and uh, o- opened me to uh, being being fully present without the, <clears throat> the fear and self-doubt that had always been there. Wow. Now, of course, I didn't live in an MDMA reality 24-7, although it was sometimes like that, um, um, but it, it it actually served me. Um, uh, I I didn't get further lost in it. I actually, uh, if you like, contacted or were able to access parts of myself that had yeah. previously been unaccessible, and that together with some, uh, well, all the work inner work I was doing, but also some very. Uh, grounded if you like uh i think it was psychosynthesis at the time so we were doing voice dialogue work and dream work and all sorts of things like that allowed me that that together with the more recreational mdma but which actually served my my inner inner growth um uh allowed me to see into myself and let go of certain outworn ways or parts of myself and grow into something new. So it was a very rich time in that sense. So so let's kind of, uh, you know, try and segue from this personal into the, into the kind of non, non-dual uh, un, un, kind of uh, understanding if you like because but, but, but what I'm what I hear from you is that you did start to see the construct but you didn't see it from a cold kind of detached place you saw everything that had created the false construct and all the motivations and reasons behind the emergence of the false construct. And you undid those. You didn't, you weren't just looking from the non-dual perspective that might say life is an illusion. It's all a dream and there's nobody here. You actually reached it through a very organic process, didn't you? Of, of, of seeing, Oh my God, I was, you know, I, that was inevitable when, when I see how much investment. Yes. Which is very yes. different in a way. Yes, yes. I, 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 it was very, uh, how can I say, practical or grounded or, yeah, yeah. It, it, it wasn't a, 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 a mental or intellectual understanding of the non-dual uh, perspective it was actually in the very nitty gritty of my life because i went then went through a very long period whilst there was this richness or this wealth on the inside of exploration and untangling and growing into or growing out of and all of that um on on the material level on the earthly level there was great impoverishment yeah there was nothing um in terms of you know 
nothing doing and nothing having. <laughs> so yeah. I, I was able to somehow those two things, that juxtaposition, uh, uh allowed, a uh, a very organic and grounded in the earthly experience, in the human experience, undoing of all um, identifications with doing and having, <laughs> yeah, and 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 just allowing what wanted to move here, what wanted to, yeah, which sometimes was was not much. And sometimes was, but it was, yeah, it had no, uh, let's put it this way. It, it had no agenda for the outcome. Whereas the whole academic situation was totally driven by agenda for the outcome. Yeah. So I started to live life from no agenda uh, and no striving and uh, uh, more and more allowing and really surrender, surrender to what is. And of course, life continues as a human being and you get guided here or there or an impulse comes or nothing comes. But even when nothing came, like, what am I going to do? What am I going to be? You know, mm -hmm. uh, that didn't arise. So it was very, very um just in the unknown, really. That's where I think the, that that started to reveal itself more that I was actually living from the unknown as the unknown without any overlay of who I think I am or who I want to be. <laughs> yeah. It didn't have that overlay. And that's, that really laid the ground only in retrospect for a deeper and fuller, uh, non-dual realization yeah where the whole scaffolding came down <laughs> oh yeah so w w what does that mean then what 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 let's move let's move from that one the the preamble of the collapse of the false construct because in some ways one could say oh well that's that <laughs> now i can just live kind of organically yeah, well, it could, have been, it, it could have been, and that would have been probably enough. Yeah, because there's but, a but, but there's still a there's still a self in a way that's 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 functioning. It's just not as kind of some, as as driven by dysfunctionality or pleasing or whatever it is as the the previous one. The but self, that was not good enough. That's not enough for you. Then you had to go even further. <laughs> Well, no, I didn't. I didn't know I was going further. It, in some ways, it was enough. There oh. was, there was just simply that, <laughs> and that was, if you like, accepted or, you know, enjoyed. If you like, it wasn't. Yeah, it just simply was that. Um, but. Uh, life or one's inner unfoldment has other plans. And so there was a deepening. And in that deepening, other aspects or more other deeper aspects of the construct of self revealed themselves. Yeah. And, and that was the abandonment. Yeah. The core sense of abandonment from God, <laughs> yeah, which had, which wasn't to do with my past, which wasn't to do with my circumstances. Yeah? It was an existential landscape and that just revealed itself. Yeah? That's not something that I sought out to look for <clears throat> or resolve or, or, or anything. There was just, it just revealed itself. Yeah. And that, the, 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 the meeting of that allowed the main pin of self to come undone. Yeah. And that's what I would call awakening. <laughs> <laughs> 
The rest um, of and, it was a preamble. <laughs> and so the main pin coming undone means means there is no longer a construct, either mental, psychological, emotional, or energetic in the subtle realm. There's no longer any construct of separation. There's no longer a me that is separate from life, from what is happening now. There is no longer a me having this experience. Yeah, so there we come to the non-dual ex- experience exactly or right. expression, nobody here. Nobody here doesn't mean that your body isn't here. Yeah, Whilst you're alive, your body is here. The body is here. The, the whole mind-body system is here. Yeah, Nobody here means there's no self, no construct of self, of me, standing outside of la- life having an experience of life. There is nobody here to whom life is happening. Therefore, there's nobody here who is trying to, to get anything from life, do anything to life, run away from life. It's a complete mergement with what is, which means the deepest acceptance of what is. There's nobody here to resist it or control it or manipulate it. It's all happening seamlessly as one. (laughs) The the radical (laughs) impact of that, the radical impact of that is inexpressible, is inexpressible, yeah? It's quite difficult now, which is 20 years later, to really yes, but touch that fragrance, yeah? Because it's moved and it's been embodied and integrated and yeah. has become very ordinary. But when that took place and for yeah. the years, for several years following that, even I would say longer than that, seven, eight years following to that, following that, it had a radical impact. Yeah. 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 It, 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 but, mm, oh God, sorry. But the maturation that you've gone through with the articulation and exploration of this over the years has given you a certain voice to be able to speak to it uh, in the way that that you do and what you've what you've described is not a an experience that was particular to a mode of mar you what you're talking about is the perennial nature the fundamental truth of the human experience when it's stripped away of all of its constructness that's right. That's the nature of non-duality Advaita is that it's not your truth. It's not my truth. It's, it's not an experience. It is the foundation of reality as we're, as, as it seems. So that's right. It's very juicy. It's, it, you know, and I, I, I bathe in this, this ocean all the time, the same way you do, uh, maybe not to such a beautiful, uh, uh, extent in a way but still as i listen to you i try and listen to you you're the, you know that description of it you know as somebody else might listen to it and it sets the mind on fire it sets the self of the mind of the self on fire because it can't reconcile these two things it can't reconcile being a cavy with a body and a mind and this face and this beard in the world speaking to you now and the fundamental uh, truth or reality that's being pointed to, which is there's no one here, cannot reconcile those two things. So something has to happen. Either the truth that you're talking becomes just a belief and I'm going to override any other sensation. And to me, I've seen the radical non-dualists and they tend to not be juicy in the body or juicy in the, you know, they 
they they laugh about it because it's a hilarious thing but it's not really an, an embodied thing yeah or else or else i don't know really know what we yeah. we end up talking about this kind of juicy exploration sorry i uh, you see well, what i'm saying we're talking yeah? about the nature of enlightenment yeah mm. it's like the light bulb has been yeah sh- shone on the nature of illusion illusion not being that your body is an illusion or your you know or anything that you experience being an illusion the illusion is the is the the many constructs of self which define your experience of life and your experience of yourself and your experience of others and your experience of the human earthly condition when when that's all yeah when the light has been shone on that it, it it's seen to be illusory it's it's made up yeah and so we start to experience that's why i say it's radical everything we experience relationships we experience uh, life we experience what happens we experience what doesn't happen we experience what we like and what we don't like what is painful and what is uh, ecstatic we experience all that completely differently when there's no overlay of the illusory construct of self <laughs> yeah that's enlightenment yeah so, um, yes, we are talking about something, not an experience, but mm. a, a, a fundamental realization or uh, coming home to our original nature. Yeah. That is not, doesn't belong to me and doesn't belong to anybody. It's, it's, it's what, it's what is when the overlay of the uh, self constructs and like layers of identity is no longer there. And then we call that self-realization. We call that liberation. We call that the, the non-dual understanding uh, or, or recognition. We call it what, what we like. But there it is. And it's not, it's not, it doesn't belong to anyone. Yeah, it's not something that we take possession of again or ownership. Of course, then if we, for whatever reason, life uh, emerges through us and we end up being, if you like, or, or, or being in the role or the expression of uh, what we call a spiritual teacher or whatever it is, or guide or non-dual teacher or whatever, then it starts to develop a unique quality or fragrance that comes through that individual. Why, why does the same realisation uh, in 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 one teacher, let's say, or human being, lead to uh, the same realization. I'm saying, lead to a, a kind of cold detachedness, if you like, in one person or teacher, uh, and actually a warm, compassionate uh, quality in another teacher, because actually they've had the same realization. Mm. Well, uh, here is where it gets a little tricky, and I've contemplated and considered this in many different ways over the years um, of being immersed in this in this particular <laughs> world or, or, or yeah scenario um a, a primary question comes to mind and some possible answers come to mind as well one is is it the same realization um, I like to think it is, and I used to think it is, and I still think it is the same realization. <laughs> well, I hear a doubt somewhere in you. Well, I I, st- I I can't categorically absolutely know that it is because I'm not mm. inside that person or mm. that teacher or the one who's expressing it. Mm. My experience of others in this role sometimes leads me to question whether it is. I, I I have a sense that it's the same realization, but it hasn't penetrated in the same way. Yes. yes. Or that there is still a remnant of the self-construct that takes ownership of it. Oh. Yeah. And then it can become a more cold, detached 
upholding of that. And that's a tricky area. Yeah. We call that the tricky spiritual ego or the subtle yeah, veneer yeah, of ego. Yeah. And that's what I think happens. That's the re-emergence of the, of the yes. I as claiming uh, yes, because there is a re-emergence of the self. Of course, you're still here as a physiological mind-body system. Yeah, it's just not held together in the same way. <laughs> it's permeable. It's open. And I think when it re-emerges, for some, it may re-emerge a little more, shall I say, vic- vociferously, and then it can take ownership of that which has been realised. And so, I think then there are, I mean, on a, on a say Zen path or with a, with a, yeah, yeah with a spiritual guru or whatever mm-hmm. you want to call it, you would uh, have further. Yes, uh, yes, yes. Like, that would be the beginning. <laughs> teachings, yeah. tests, uh, yeah. yeah, and so on. Because that You're does still not a in. Jedi. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. So until it was completely broken open and there's, there's, there's nobody here. <laughs> yeah. So um, (laughs) there's nobody here to claim ownership. There is something here as a mind-body organism, but it functions naturally, not uh, polluted, if you like, or tainted by self-constructs. Yeah, that's the difference. So all of that, yeah. Let's do a quick look at that again, yeah. Say that, say, let's, let's just, that was, uh, there was a jewel in there and it just went past so quickly. You can't <clears> hold <throat> on to the jewels. <laughs> <laughs> and there it is, everybody. <laughs> you can't hold on to the jewels because it doesn't come from yeah. so, knowledge. So, but we can try and touch that again. Yeah. What did I say? I don't know. I think you was kind of saying in a way, I, I, I'd only interpret badly here, that I think you were saying there is a, there's a mental realisation, and but some something else hasn't. Yeah. Oh, God, that's terrible. Mm. <laughs> it's the same realisation, but inevitably, because we're still alive, yeah, we are. Yeah in a body or as a body, inevitably, even after enlightenment, liberation, whatever, the the mind-body organism re-emerges. Yes, yes. yes. It's still here. So there's nobody here. There's nobody here as a self-construct taking ownership of its experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because there's no more separation between me and the experience or the life, what's happening, what's appearing. Yeah. But the, 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 the mind body organism still operates. Now, when that mind body organism operates without any construct of ownership, then there's nobody here. But there is a mind-body organism functioning naturally, organically, transparently, permeably, and there's no taking ownership of experience with an agenda or upholding anything. In other words, the construct of ego self has not re-emerged. However, and that was your original question, why is it in some who mm. do have the same profound undoing of the construct of self and enlightenment mm. then seem to express from a very subtle, usually sometimes not so subtle, upholding of that position, which may seem to be then uh extreme, radical, cold, detached. Fundamental. Yeah. Why is it? Well, given what we're describing now, as the mind-body organism re-emerges, there has been a realization of there's nobody here Mm because the self-construct has come undone. But with that re-emergence of the mind-body organism comes a little remnant of the ego self. Yeah. The subtle veneer of ego. Mm. 
and that sneaks in and then ends up being expressed either as an extreme uh, non-dual <laughs> yeah, state or it starts to play out in terms of subtle power, yeah, uh, games, if you like, constructs and so on. Why is it for some that that comes in and for some it doesn't? Well, for that, I think that's not something we can say there's a mm-hmm. no. ABC equation for, no, 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 but we can look at some of the factors. For some people, their original ego construct, their sense of self is quite strong. Yes, yes, yes. Why? Because either that's the conditioning, yeah, they've been brought up in a particular uh, configuration that that seems to uphold a strong sense of self, which is healthy in mm-hmm. some ways. For me, I didn't have that, which was no. not very healthy at the time. Yeah, um, it could be that that's the personality structure or the sacred geometry you're born into. If we can look at that from a sort of astrological point of view, mm. you might come in as a particular quality yeah. or vibration that has a very strong sense of self and that serves something. And for some, it's much vaguer, much more yeah, airy or watery or something. It could be karmic. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and so on. So there are mm. many factors for that. Yeah. Now, if you look at Perhaps where we started this conversation, my particular history and geometry and circumstances and configurations, because there was so much fragmentation, because there was so much unknownness about who I was, who I am, when it came undone, there wasn't much there to reform itself <laughs> because I'd been battered by life and so many things That's had been taken funny. away. My father had been taken away from me. Uh, my my home, uh, yeah, my, uh, being in a war, everything gets taken away. Safety, yeah, certainty gets taken away and that. That was right when I was a child. So, uh, yeah, I was, yeah, I, I really felt that and knew what that was. So there was never certainty and safety ever again um, because That's of cool. the whole <laughs> PhD that I'd spent, I don't know, I can't remember, it was 12 years or more totally given to that came undone because many things in my life came undone very, very dramatically. Um, there wasn't much ground to stand on. Right, so right, when yeah. it reemerged, when this mind body organism reemerged, which of course it did, it didn't have any ground to stand on. Mm. So perhaps that has something to do with it. Well, I think it, uh, it, it, it does in a way. Thank you for your, your uh, explanation. I mean, there is no accounting for why that, why that is. But I do see, you know, for you, I, I think you, even though it can be quite frustrating in a way, it's kind of easier in a certain sense to say there's nobody here and that's that. And it's slammed down. And actually, it serves a it serves a good purpose in in some ways for people, yeah. But then we have to. There has to be a, at some point, in my humble opinion, an exploration, a deeper exploration of what that means, of how to reconcile there being nobody here, but yet there's somebody here at the same time. And that juxtaposition of those two things, I think you enjoy. I think you like that because it actually means something in your own life. It's like wraps up your own life of being a nobody and being a somebody. And so you've 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 dived into the depths of of of, of being a human being, you know, on a on a on a psychological and a psycho-spiritual and a spiritual level. And this is because most things that we do in life are all about ourselves, is actually you're teaching the 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 fundamental point for yourself which is what is this existence to 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 be a somebody and to invest so much in it and for it to be wiped out so quickly is that real what is that you know who is Mm. that person and then to be able to live as a nobody you know with no identity in a sense nothing and emptiness and then to kind of you know build a sort of life where you talk to people about these two very things because it does confuse the modern human being and actually has confused human beings ad infinitum. Yes. No, because I, I, we take I, ourselves to be somebody and we're not somebody. 
Yeah, I, I love that. You're right. I love that juxtaposition. You know, of, of the, you know that paradox of emptiness and fullness. Yes, um, this is what you speak about. All I the time. speak about all the time. Yeah, emptiness and fullness, and that emptiness and fullness includes uh, the whole continuum of birth and death. Yeah, um, and again, I speak a lot about or some about that, but. But but all of that is is it was an existential question, isn't it? It was an ex- existential exploration. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, that's what I mean. You know, that's why I see for you. You know that actually it it, it kind of goes beyond. And I think you're in a position these days where actually I don't really want to share too much with people. But actually, I see you're going beyond the kind of simple non-dual questions. You know, which actually the non-dual questions do open us up into the existential, the perennial existential questions of what it means to be a human being. You know, what is what is this yes. that we're, we're which, which experiencing? Which actually was was a, a question that was alive in me, uh, very at a very young age, around uh, I think around the age of fourteen, which is when I started exploring Jung and, and some others around that time. Um, but it was like, yeah, what is this existence? What, what, what is it? What is it? What, you know, it's an existential question. I mean, I should have studied philosophy, but <laughs> yes. I, I, I didn't. And, and yeah, for whatever reason, we don't have to go into that. But, but that was alive in me. And actually it was what motivated me to even begin to study psychology. Now yes. we don't have to go, well, we will go over this just briefly, but I've yeah. said it before. It was totally hijacked. Yes. That whole exploration was totally hijacked by my need to get some kind of access to a university, which ended up being experimental psychology so because you, of certain you, conditions your, in my your, life. That- your desire was to follow from 14 years old the, the fundamental questions of what it means to be a human being, i.e., a different sort of psychology. A different sort of psychology. That, that, uh, yeah. So? Uh, yeah. I ended up in experimental behavioral psychology, which was right. absolutely anathema to me. <laughs> One of the problems was <laughs> nobody understood what I was talking about. And of course, when you're at school at that age, they say, well, what do you want to be? Yes. <laughs> and I tried to explain that. They said, oh, why don't you become a science illustrator? you know, because it was a marriage of science and art. And I was trying to explain it from the existential point of view that it's a a marriage of science and art, much like Leonardo da Vinci or Jung or something. But I mean, this went way over their heads or they thought I was too big for my own boots or something and said, you know, so I got led (laughs) on a practical level down the road of uh, applying for a university degree that happened yeah. to be experimental psychology. I didn't even know it was experimental psychology. And that's where I ended up. Um, but the point of that little <clears throat> detour was just to say that that question, the existential question, yeah. what is this existence? What does it mean to be existent as yes, a human being? Exactly. Do yeah. we exist? Don't we exist? Is there yeah. such a thing as existence and non-existence, which is the whole question of emptiness of, and fullness. Yeah. And that was alive in me way back then and then got totally yeah. hijacked, overtaken by yeah the direction of, of, of my studies and also by my own need to get some yeah. damn qualification so I could be somebody. <laughs> but uh, but but again, I'll point back to the divine blessing of life, which is you know the the, the karmic path that we are on in some ways has a has an extraordinary quality of bringing you uh, to the exactly the place that you wanted to go anyway. <laughs> So Absolutely. it took you on a it took you on a merry uh, merry journey, and and probably that journey, to be perfectly frank, in, in in a way, brought that brought something so deeply into your personal experience that you were it wasn't there was never any 
uh, from the top down, which can be a philosophical understanding or even a non-dual realization from what I would call the top down. But actually yours ended up in, in many ways coming from the inside out. And that's why you actually do have a fragrance of this. It's an inside out experience coupled with a profound intellectual or mental understanding that you've got because you 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 have got that kind of quality so it's a great marriage i think yes. to me i think you've I, I love it because there's a great marriage in this teaching that that you and i offer is it there is a marriage of these of, of these qualities because it's not wishy-washy it's actually very you know really trying to get to the heart of the matter in a very deep and honest way i think absolutely and 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 you know i had no idea that it would end up here in this no. place the way it's expressing itself and the way it's playing itself out i have no idea and 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 sometimes i come across the assumption um that all so-called non-dual teachers, which I seem to be in that category. Um, I don't like to be in any category, but there we are. Um, uh, but, you know, there's the assumption that a non-dual teacher, you know, used to be something completely different with no interest or no personal unfoldment of this and uh, then had a non-dual realization and suddenly jumps on the bandwagon and becomes a non-dual teacher you know it's it's like you know occasionally i you know well we don't have to go into the stories but um and that's you know for i don't know about others but for me that's not the case um like you said, and as we've described, it was a deep question right from the early days. No idea it would go through all these sort of permutations to end up as this. Um, so yes, it's from the inside out. It couldn't yeah. be anything okay. else. <laughs> no, and and that's why you wrote that book, Embodied Enlightenment. Really, was to speak <laughs> to that. It was right from the, from the get go. I think you mm. were talking about it so i mean yes yeah, so you you're not very good at being included in a in a club of, of assumptions <laughs> about non dualists i i i actually think that's pretty good mm. do you mm. i think yes i think uh, that's... i don't know whether we've dissected anything but we certainly had a good adventure in using your own story you know which is very interesting as a as a as a kind of metaphor for each of us because each of us has the same kind of story built in somewhere. Yeah, and it's up to us to find, find if we're called to, to find that that juxtaposition. The, the, the meeting place between being a nobody and, and, and living in the world from an open space. That's why I love what you talk about, openness and fullness. To be nobody still in the world, to be, yeah, for the construct of, I talk about it, the construct falls down and you live from the de- demolition, mm-hmm. the demolition. That's right. It's a beautiful demolition. It sounds terrifying, and a, to a certain extent, it is. But there's such an exquisite beauty. Yeah, it was the, the greatest living from demol- demolition. Yeah, yeah the greatest place, uh, the greatest blessing. Yeah. was the demolition of self. Yeah. <laughs> All right, people. I think we're going to leave it on the de- demolition of a murder and cavi, <laughs> and uh, and um, there are a couple of somebody nobodies here, and I think. Where are we going to meet? Uh, possibly in the kitchen. <laughs> Two nobodies <laughs> going to probably have a bit of toast in the kitchen. Um, Amodo, <laughs> thank you so much for, for for joining me and sharing your story, actually. Mm-hmm. It's very good. My very pleasure. beautiful to fun. hear the backstory <laughs> of, uh, of, of, a, of a teacher. And um, <laughs> we'll see you again next time, we hope. Um, share this if you, if you, if you are moved to. And, uh, that's it. Nothing more to say. Amoda, thank you so much. Be well. See you soon. Namaste. Okay. <laughs>